we just have to accept the fact he says he loves us, and he does. How much more could he do than give his own son for us? Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. I want to speak to you about drawing near. That's really kind of the title for these verses from 19 to 25 is drawing near. But it answers a question that I think we need to answer, especially as we are coming to church in the 21st century. And we need to answer the question, why go to church? After all, the passage that we're about to read is the voice of unalterable truth. In none of the Jewish ceremonies was since ever removed without the shedding of blood, and in no case and by no means was sin ever pardoned without atonement. It is clear that there was no hope apart from Jesus Christ, and for there is no other blood shedding that is even worth us thinking about atonement for sin, because only the blood of God could atone for the sins of humanity. Therefore, we have to ask ourselves a few questions. For example, are we true believers? Do we really believe that the blood is His atonement and that it has been applied to our soul? God has set forth as a propitiation or a making of things right because we have sinned in this world and things are not right. What a blessing it is to know that God has pardoned our sin through this propitiation. And so why in the world should we look anywhere else? Yet the world continues to look for atonement somewhere outside of Jesus Christ. People of other religions, they don't understand how we can rejoice that our sins are forgiven, forgiven for Christ's sake. They don't get it. They don't understand it. And even lost people, if they're not a believer, you don't understand about the whole thing about our sins are forgiven for His sake. Their works, their prayers, their ceremonies give them no comfort whatsoever. The only restoration there is for a guilty conscience is Jesus Christ and His suffering on the cross. Because the blood is life. So, let's rest assured that this life of faith and joy and is by every means the marvelous grace of God. When a person hears the truth of God's word, he either accepts it or he rejects it. This passage that we're going to look at today is written to those who accept it. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 he makes it clear that salvation involves faith, hope, and love. He says in chapter 13, beginning in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, yet I have not love. I have become sounding brass and clanging cymbal. He says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge that I should have faith, so then the mountains would be removed. But yet I have not, not love, then I am nothing. And though I bestow my goods on the poor to feed them, and though I give my body to be burned, yet if I have not love, it profits me nothing. I mean, there is no salvation in it. Love suffers long, it is kind. It does not envy, it does not parade itself, it is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Love seeks its own. It does not seek its own. It does not provoke. It is not evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity. But it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. And where there are tongues, they will cease. And though there be knowledge, it will all vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be taken away or shall pass away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, and was taught as a child. But when I became a man, I took away all childish things. For now I see in a mirror. It's dimly, but I see face to face. But now I know in part, but then I shall know as I am known. And now in part, but then I will know as I am known. And therefore, this is what abides, faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. So, Pastor, why did you read 1 Corinthians if you're doing Hebrews? Because this passage, chapter 10, verse 9 through 25, focuses on these three, faith, hope, and love. Our faith can that we have can give us the confidence to enter boldly into the presence 
of Almighty God into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because of the blood. We talked about the blood last week. We're going to talk a little bit more about it next week. It's because of the blood. That's what is essential. It was not your blood. It was not the blood of lambs or goats. It was the, the blood of God himself. So do not ever become ashamed of the blood that set your soul free. There are people that who's ashamed to even talk about Jesus, his death, burial, resurrection. They certainly don't talk about the blood. It's offensive. You better believe it's offensive. It's what took to, for God to, to, to save your soul and my soul. It was an offense to him. They had to give his son up to be brutalized for 33 and a half years and then to give his, his life up and to raise himself from the dead. It is offensive, but that's what it takes to save your soul. Don't ever be ashamed about talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. Whenever a non-believer tries to enter the presence of God, he finds no access at all. But a true believer, according to Scripture today, and multiple others, we have been given access. So our text begins in chapter 10, verse 19. Read with me if you will. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence. Notice it doesn't say we might have confidence. This is affirmative here. Since we have confidence to enter to the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil. Remember the veil in the temple. It was through his flesh. And since we have a great <coughs> priest over the house of God, let us draw near or let us approach God with a sincere heart in full assurance of our faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Doesn't depend on you, doesn't depend on me, depends on him. He's the one that holds us. Let us consider how to encourage one another in love and in good deeds, not abandoning our meetings together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see that day coming or approaching or drawing near. Hebrews chapter 10, why I go to church. William Willimon, the chaplain at Duke University years ago, he was called to preach at an inner city church. The service lasted for over two and a half hours. He was exhausted. And afterwards he asked the pastor about it. He says, is it like this every Sunday, two and a half to three hours? He said, every Sunday. He said, why... Do they stay here for two and a half and three hours Sunday after Sunday after Sunday? He said, because unemployment in our area is almost at 50%. He said, every time my congregation goes out, the world lies to them. The world says, you're a loser because you don't have a brand new house. You're a failure because you don't have a brand new car. And, and it condemns them over and over and over. He said, so it takes me two and a half to three hours to get them to understand the world lies. You are not a loser. In fact, you're a child of the king. Well, the world does us the same way. It tries us to get to live our lives the way they want us to live rather than the way that God wants us to live. And the world certainly pressures Christians to conform to its values rather than to God's values. So why go to church? That's a question that is answered in this passage. The world continues to, to push us away from God and draw us more into itself because God uses exhortation and fellow believers to encourage us. There are five things I want us to see all surrounding Jesus and His blood and what He has done as five reasons you ought to go to church. Now, I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, preacher, I mean, this is the 21st century. There's just a lot going on. And Sunday's my only day off. You know where I want to be if Sunday was ever my day off? I want to be in church. And for these five reasons. Some people say, well, I don't like the music. Well, there's churches out there with all kinds of different music. Well, I don't like the preacher. There's a lot of different preachers out there. Some people say, I, I like this one. Well, I can watch it on TV. Let me tell you what you can't do on TV. You can't fellowship. You can't go up and hug somebody's neck who is hurting. You can't go up and, and shake their hands and mouth. I haven't seen you in two weeks. I am so glad to see you. It's called fellowship. And God provided that. We have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with each other. And it's one of the reasons. So this whole idea, well, I can watch it on TV. Yeah, but you can't get everything you need. Not on TV. Not like coming here to where you can use an altar. If you want to come and pray, you can pray at the altar. <clears throat> well, you don't understand, preacher. I like sleeping late. Sunday's on a day. I can sleep late. Come in your pajamas. If you can go to Walmart, 
<laughs> in your pajamas, come to church. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll take a table or something, wrap around, take a tablecloth and wrap around, something. Come to church. It's important. <laughs> you know, I just feel, and you fill in the blank. People always have different answers when they don't come to church. However, the author of Hebrew disagrees with every answer you can give him. For one thing, our own spiritual warfare is not the only concern. When we go to church, we go to give and we get go to get, but we also go to spur other Christians to love and good works. That's what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, 25. Notice what he says. Let us consider how to encourage one another in what? In love and in good deeds. Not abandoning. No, see, this is a strong word. It really means to forsake, to get rid of. Don't get rid of, don't abandon our meetings that we have together, and is the habit of something. We know a lot of people today who they have abandoned coming to church. But encouraging one another, in all the more you see the day coming or drawing near. That's the way we ought to be living, too, knowing that Jesus Christ, that day, I can't, I can't tell you when he's coming, but I can tell you this, he is coming because he promised. And it sure looks like it won't be too awful long. On the other hand, if we attend and we get involved and we're enthusiastic about going to church, it does encourage other believers to want to be a part of it, to grow in their faith, to be a strong witness to this world. Adam W. Robinson was an American evangelical, distinguished professor of preaching and president of Gordon Connell Theological Seminary. This is what he said about it. He said, the Christian faith allows no room for rugged individualist to have a fire. You need more than one coal. You need a spark and you need a draft of air. One humble, open, involved individual, perhaps even you, set on fire by Christ, can be that spark and the Holy Spirit can be the breath of God that will blow that spark and set your entire congregation ablaze. Oh God, set us ablaze. May we have that kind of an attitude. May we leave this place so in love and on fire for God that people notice and they want what they see. We ought to come to church because there are discouraged people that are walking around needing the encouragement from you and the encouragement from me. Notice he says in verse 19, he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have this boldness, this confidence to enter into the place with the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated himself for us through the veil that was through his flesh. And since we have such a great priest over the house of God, this whole idea of having boldness, this is a stated fact. This is not an exhortation. It said, live, live this way and you'll get bold. This is a, you've got it already. You've got the boldness. If you are a true born-again believer, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he's stating a fact here. Having boldness to enter. We've got it. The problem is too many times we sit outside and look. We're afraid of what's on the other side of the veil. The veil's been ripped from top to bottom. We have access to the Holy of Holies. Why? Because of the Day of Atonement. When Jesus Christ gave his life on the cross, all your sins were forgiven. So we can go boldly. We have that boldness if we just use it. Too many times we have things that we don't use. Think of Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes, filthy, stinking, rich, lived in poverty. Didn't realize what he had. There are so many people, there are Christians today that are living in spiritual poverty because you don't understand what you got. You've got boldness. Use it. You know, your baseball players going up to, to, to bat, and the first pitch comes by, and he just stands there and looks at the pitcher, second pitch, third pitch. They're all strikes, they're all hittable. He could have hit one of them, but he didn't. He's just standing there waiting and waiting and waiting. Well, he wouldn't be on the ball team very long, would he? Don't you think, well, God don't kick us off for not using what he's already given us. He has given you boldness. Let us go boldly before the throne of God because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Do we realize really what we've got? We need to begin to realize that. Because Jesus Christ gave his life for you to have boldness and me to have boldness. And we can do that because we've got a clean heart because he is the one who cleaned it. Mr. says, we went without fear and trembling. 
having boldness to enter. It literally means to have a present and conscious experience. You're to be able to have an experience with God because you can go into the very throne room. The Bible talks about it being rent from top to bottom. There wasn't God taking it and folded it up to be used at a different time. He tore it apart never to be used again. The only access you have is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The world doesn't have that access, but you do. And so we are to use it, having boldness to enter. Also it says, notice it's a new and living way. This means that the sacrifice of Jesus is always seen fresh in the mind of God. God never forgets it. He forgets your sin. He puts his sin behind your back. You realize the sins you'll commit tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, they're already behind his back. He's already chosen not to think about them. But what he does think about is the fact that his son died on the cross for the sins of the world. And notice it says here, a new and living way. It literally means that there's something that's always fresh. It's always fresh on his mind. A new and living way. A way of eternity. Something that was freshly slain. By the way, when was Jesus slain? Some people say, well, it was in the year 33 A.D. or 32 A.D. or 34 A.D. And that's not when he was slain. Revelation says he was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. You realize before God even created matter or energy, before God created anything, Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was slain a lot longer before his body was nailed to a cross. Which tells us this next one here when he says a new, and notice it's a living way. The word living there literally means dependent of a life source. You see, I'm dependent on God. I am going to live until God says, Ed, it's time to come home. And I won't say, Lord, give me 30 more seconds because by that time it's, it's gone. I mean, I've been a firm believer ever since I've been a Christian. According to the scripture, I'm not going to extend my life one second after God wants it. And nobody's going to take it one second before he wants it. I'm his. I'm dependent on him. However, this is of Jesus here in his sacrificial <coughs> offering, a new and living way. It literally means de being dependent from any other life source. Why? Because Jesus himself is life. He doesn't need a life source. He doesn't need electricity. He doesn't need any. He is life. There's a new way. We can enter into the to the throne room of God, and not only now, but when we also get to heaven. Why? It's in life. It's a new and living way. It's through the veil into the holy of holies. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51 makes it clear that this was not something that was temporary. When God himself ripped that veil, there was no longer, because the veil's what kept the priest out, remember? The priest would go in once a year, he'd offer sacrifices. That was torn. Why? Because we didn't need them. When he says that which was old or that which was in part will be done away with, it was done away with. 2,000 years ago, when God himself ripped that veil in two, that allowed access for some. Who? For those who believe. You have access. I have access that this world doesn't have. I want them to have it, and you should want them to have it. But the only way to have it is to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Why? Because it was through his flesh that we received that access. The truth is, for believers... The veil was not rolled up, but it was torn. It was not unhooked. It was not folded up. It was not put away for use at a later day. It was torn never to be used again. And just about every theologian that you can imagine from the beginning of time with the, with the church fathers all the way up to today believe that that is to be true. Here he seems to suggest that not only when the body of Jesus was torn asunder, but on the cross, his blood became available for the supreme purpose in which it was meant, meaning to, for the salvation of men. And you know one of the things that an unbeliever just cannot ever get the concept? He doesn't understand why some people hear God's word and they believe that their salvation is through their own means. Now next week we will look at people who also heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they rejected it. Their end is not nearly as nice as the end for today. Because for those who have put their faith and trust, you've got access to God. You know, you, according to Scripture, you can go and sit in Father's lap and say, Daddy, I heard. I got, I've got something to do today. Will you, will you talk with me? And he'll say, yes. Yes, son, yes, daughter, I will. You've got access to God because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. But you've got to believe it. That's where the key is. 
Let me get reiterate this. This is written to a person who hears the word of God and accepts it. And then by faith, hope, and love applies it to their life. And if they apply the faith, hope, and love, they will have the confidence that they need to enter into the holy of holies. And this also says we have a high priest over the house of God. We have a high priest who presides over heavenly courts. And that is Jesus Christ. No one else could but him. Notice this combination of the way and the priest. It gives us confidence. It frees us from fear and all the things that, that keep us put down. F.F. F. Bruce reminds us. He says the house of God, which Jesus exercised his high priesthood over, he said, of course, it's nothing less than a community of God's people. Now think about this for a moment. Those believers in the Old Testament that put their faith and trust that God would do what he said he would do, they were believers. Abraham was a believer. They're part of our fellowship. The New Testament, the ones looking back to the cross, and even up to today, we have, we're part of God's community. We have fellowship with Him. There's a day you get to sit down with Abraham and talk to him and ask him what it was like for different things. We'll have the opportunity. Of course, that'll probably be a million years down the road after we get there, because the first million years will probably be the feet of Jesus. Say, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Not only did you save me, but you gave me boldness. Where while I am still here on earth, I can talk to him. Notice this. <clears throat> also, we need to, to go to church because of what Jesus did, encouraging us to draw near to God. Look at verse 22. Let us draw near. Let us approach God with a true heart. Notice this. Full of faith. We were supposed to have faith every single day. Not faith today and lack of faith tomorrow. How do we do that? He says, having your heart sprinkled from an equal conscience and your bodies washed with pure water. That's what happened on Calvary. He says, because of that, let us draw near with a perfect cleansing available to us, described in terms of the new covenant. He says, you have your heart sprinkled. And Christian practice of baptism, you have your bodies washed. He says, when you do those things, you will have full assurance of your faith. Therefore, the appeal to me is not to prepare myself to go to heaven. It is simply to come. It is to draw near. And I'm to do that by coming to church and drawing near to God in church, drawing near to you in church. <clears throat> we can't do it if our fear falters. Most he says, come. No matter what our excuses have been in the past, no matter what our testimony is, he says, if you are a true believer, you are to come. Let us draw near, approach to God. Notice this, with a sincere, genuine, true heart. Not a fake heart, not a phony heart. A heart that is full of assurance, not half full. Having our hearts sprinkled clean with, from an evil conscience and with our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, under those conditions, which met those, let us hold firmly to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. You know why we can be, be, be sure that what the writer of Hebrews is saying is true? is because it's not up to you to hold it. It's up to God to hold it. God is one who holds my salvation. I don't hold my salvation. If I did, I'd be in trouble. I would I'd forget it or I'd lose it or something. But this is just, it's him who does the holding. They may have thought that they had many other problems. He's, remember, he's writing to the Jews who had become Christians and are scattered now, they would have had persecution and difficult relationships and difficult circumstances. They would have had times that the culture and the economy was, was, was on their minds. They had all kinds of problems they had to face. But the real problem was their relationship with God. It wasn't on track. That means they're not believers, but their relationship was not on track. And so the writer of Hebrews is encouraging. They didn't draw near to God on the basis of of who they were, but on the basis of what Jesus had done. You and I can draw near to God but on the basis of what Jesus has done. We need to ask the question, are you trusting in your relationship to God? Are you trusting in something else? If you're trusting in Him, you have the access to go right into the throne room of God. When we find ourselves in times of trouble, and I was, you don't go to Mother Mary, Beatles song. In times of trouble, you go to God. And you can go to him in the worst times when, when our attitudes are, are bad. 
In fact, when we have times of worry, we're indifferent to things. He says that we are to go to him, we are to draw near. It's just as important for the readers of this letter to be reminded, just like it for us, that close relationship with God is not just coming to the institution, but it's being a part of the family of God. In light of what Jesus has done, we need to hold fast to the truth. Notice it says here, holding fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Discouragement had made them waver from the truth. They were still believers, but they were wavering from the truth. They were off track. There was a renewed confidence in the greatness and the faithfulness of Jesus through this new covenant. And through that, then they could stand firm. Perhaps that exhortation, let us hold fast, might well be written on every Christian's Bible. In fact, this whole idea of let us hold fast might be a good thing to put it right above the cross. We know what the cross stands for. The cross reminds you every Sunday what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Maybe we need to be reminded also, let us hold fast to the faith. This word without wavering is a very strong word in Greek. It's translated here in the New Testament, and it's based on an object being perfectly upright, perfectly straight, and never, ever, ever bending. He says, let us not waver. It is no place in a Christian's heart and in a Christian's life. There's no room for wavering. You don't have faith today and you don't have faith tomorrow. He says, let us not waver. Even no matter how discouraged you might get. Why? Because it is he who has promised. Who promised? Jesus. God promised he would send the Messiah. He sent the Messiah. He's the one holding the, the, the documents, if you will. He's without our, our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He's holding that. Also, in light of what Jesus has done, we're to pursue community. Notice what he says here. Community is important. Verse 24. Let us consider. That, that word consider means to reckon, to really sit down and analyze it. Let us analyze. Let us think through this. Let us consider how to encourage one another in love and in our actions or our good deeds. Not abandoning our own meetings together, as is the habit of some. Well, had that not changed in the last 2,000 years? There are more and more and more people that are not coming to church. But instead, he says, encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I like that, the day you see his day drawing near. But notice he says, let us consider. Discouragement had made their community a, a place in that first century where they, they needed love stirred up. They needed good work stirred up. They needed to be encouraged. He says, Consider, how will you do that? How can you be an encouragement to other Christians? We ought, to, we ought to ask ourselves that question. There are people in this neighborhood who are Christians, but they're hurting, and they're off track in their relationship. They need to be encouraged. How can we encourage them? They're right here. I have a feeling that if we don't do something to try to encourage them, to try to reach them, God will hold us accountable. They are put right here so we can minister to them. Notice he said, let's consider, what is this? One another. This is the only place this word is used here, and it's used frequently in other places. But this is what it means. It means mutual activity. It means all of us working, not, me, not you coming to church and me pumping you up, getting you excited, you go home, and you come back the next Sunday. <coughs> that is not what it's talking about. It's about us as brothers and sisters in Christ coming together and for us to, to figure out how can I encourage you? How can you encourage me? How can we encourage each other? How can we encourage those people out there that are Christians and they're not in church? They need to be in church because they need to fellowship. And that's what he said. How can we consider to encourage one another? In what? In love and good deeds. I wonder if this whole community were to really look at us and say, you know something about them people down there. I don't necessarily agree with them. But one thing's for sure. They really do love us. I wonder what that would do to just this community. If they really, really believe that Shoreline Baptist Church, the people here, we love each other and we love them. He says, do we encourage? And now, I wonder if we wouldn't have another 20, 30, 40, 50 people in here if people in this community knew not only that God loved them, but that we love them. It would be an encouragement to them. This world needs encouragement. This is where it's stirred up here. <clears throat> It's a term that really needs to incite. We need to really come together and, and get excited, incite a riot, so to speak, of going out and telling people how much we love them, how much God loves them. It's the same word that's used in Acts chapter 15, verse 39. Paul even uses it sometimes for the word contention. 
it's translated. What it means is we need to love each other enough where we come together that we get excited about being together and we worship together and we encourage each other in love and good works. And that can only come when we are a community of faith, hope, and love. Notice he says forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. That word for, for forsaking here, it says we have literally just walked away from the fellowship. God gave me to you and you to me and us to each other. God gave us to each other. And we walk away from it. And that's what happens in so many churches. Some people go to church, they feel like, well, the only time I'm going to go is when I really need it. And they're really down, and so sometimes they come. But the problem is too many times people come to receive something from God at church, which is good. But we're here for more than that. We're here for you to get your needs met. We're here to meet your needs and to meet the needs of others. We need to be a blessing to others. We need to work together with others. We need to share our faith and our values with others. Why? Because it's important for Christians to gather together, to work together for the kingdom of God. Dr. Charles McIntosh has very accurately pointed out about this word here, saints. Now, most of the time, we don't feel like saints, if we ever do. But the Bible describes us as believers, as saints. And this is what he says. He said the word in the New Testament, the word is used for saint. Never, ever, ever is in the singular. It is inevitably plural in every, in every application. What is he saying? He's talking, he's talking about saints more gathered together. The saints are here. That doesn't mean I'm not a saint if I'm out somewhere else. He just says in the New Testament, and he finds it interesting that it's never single. It's always plural. Why? Because we're made to work together. We're made to fellowship together. We're made to come to worship together. We're made to be in God's house together. We're to assemble together. This is also before we close. As you see the day approaching. Boy, I like that. As you see the day approaching. And the reason me, he's talking about the day the Lord comes back. He says, the days as you live your life, and it seems to you that the Lord is coming back soon, you ought to be living your life in a way that your faith is even stronger as you see that day approaching. Every generation has had a group that looks and says, I believe we're getting closer and closer. And we are. Like I said earlier, I know we are 2,000 years closer than we was the day Jesus gave his life on the cross. I don't know when he's coming, but I know he's coming. I heard a story about a, a little boy in London, and he was looking at a toy shop, and he's on the corner, and his father was having a hard time getting him to, to get away from the, the toy shop. He said, well, listen, so I've got to run up here. I've got to come run a couple of You stay right here, and I'll come back. I'll be back in 30 minutes. The little boy said, okay, I'll just stay right here. Well, the man got out of town, the truck broke down, and it took him a while, I think it was a total of five hours to get back. And he was just really worried he saw him going to be there. And he pulls up in the truck, and his son is still there, but now he's sitting on the curb. And he says, I am so sorry. He explained to him all the things the truck broke down. And he says, were you worried? His son says, no one worried. He said, it's been five hours. You were not worried? He said, no, Daddy. You told me you'd come back. I knew you would. Well, Jesus promised he'd come back. And I don't know when, but I know he is. And we may be part of that generation that just feels like it could be any day now. Here one says, as you see the day approaching, there's actually something beyond the horizon. We ought to live our lives in a way that when people see us, they know we're expecting him to come. I don't know if in my lifetime. For many years, I've always had the idea that maybe it might be. That would be, that would be pretty cool. It doesn't really matter because I'm either going first or I'm going either way. It doesn't matter. I'm going because you're coming back for me. He says, as you see the day approaching, it should affect the way that we live. We have to live with hope and faith and joy and love. We live with all those things. Why? Because we see his day coming. I don't know when, but I know when it gets here. It won't pass me by. F.F. Bruce said, each successive Christian generation is called to live upon the generation of the end time if it is to live as a truly Christian generation. In other words, if I'm living my life not expecting Jesus to come back, then I'm not really living the Christian life. 
That's what he's saying. Well, God's opened the door for us. He's asked us to come in. He's given us the faith. He showed us this is what it takes. This is what my son did on the old rugged cross 2,000 years ago. Now, now that you believe, come and see me. Don't forsake yourself together. Come together to worship. But more important than that, come to worship him in a way that he knows and you know You've been in the presence of God because you have access. Lost people don't. The true believer will hunger for fellowship. People will look forward to that day when he goes to the throne room of God. Other believers have a constant desire to go to church. The question is, do we? Is there anything better you could be doing right now? Anything you could be doing better today? A lot of people give a lot of excuses. But those who want to be in church are in church. Those who want to gather together, gather together. They were head bowed, every eye closed. Let me just ask you as we think about the whole idea of drawing near and why to go to church. Do you find yourself giving excuses for why not to go to church? I can think of one major reason. And that is because the love of God, God loves me and you so much that he gave everything he had. He gave his very, very best. And then he gives us access to him on top of that. Think about it for just a second. You, if you're a Christian, if you love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, if you are His, you have access. And you'll always have access. Will you take advantage of it?